good to see you again. Um, I do want to introduce Dr. Patterson. Um, we're definitely excited to have him in the community with us. Uh, and um, as you can see on the board, he's, he's got a pretty distinguished uh, career behind him already. Um, graduated from the University of South Alabama. Um, he was training up in North Carolina and then been working nearby for five years. Five years, yeah. So, um, you know, we're happy to have him. As we get him over here, I'll let him say a few words. And then we'll move on. Well, I walked in and saw one of my patients right at the beginning. So, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Silicaga. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have been in Alexander City for the past five years, and as George Jefferson said, I'm moving on up. So um, <laughs> prior to that, I practiced in Macon, Georgia, in a private partnership for 26 and a half years. So I do have a lot of experience, hopefully more than it looks like I should have. Um, but I'm excited to be here. Look forward to taking care of the folks of Silicaga with their urologic issues, um, and want to get to know y'all. So I think I will hold this. I don't think my ear is shaped right to stay on my head. Um, it's not the only thing funny looking about me, so we'll, we'll get over get over that. Um, you know, if I can work there, we go. So today's topic is acid reflux. Um, I'm going to ask just for a show of hands. Don't be embarrassed. Who in this room has had heartburn at any point in your life? All right, everybody with your hand up, I feel your pain. Everybody with your hands down, liars. Uh, but that's okay, we're not going to do this. Um, you know, what is acid reflux? Uh, basically, acid reflux is when the acid that your stomach produces to help digest your food doesn't stay where it's supposed to be. And instead of staying in your stomach, it creeps up your esophagus, your food pipe, where it doesn't belong. And when that happens, your, your esophagus doesn't want to feel acid burn, and so it, it can be painful and cause a lot of a lot of discomfort. Um, as the slide there shows, uh, over 60 million Americans have heartburn at least once a month, um, and you know, 15 million have heartburn daily. As you can imagine, that's that's not the most comfortable to wait to. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 All right. I'll have to hold it real close. Yeah. It's weird. But that's okay. So um, chronic heartburn, in addition to being very uncomfortable, it can cause some serious complications. Um, it can cause esophagitis, which is actually erosion of the esophagus. You can get ulcers of the esophagus. Um, that chronic inflammation can cause your esophagus to narrow and restrict your down, which can make it hard for you to swallow foods. Um, you can get a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which, which is a precancerous condition. And you can even develop esophageal cancer as a result of chronic year after year as a reflux. Oh boy. So what are some of the causes of acid reflux? Um, obesity and that pressure from extra weight can cause acid reflux. Some people have a hernia in their diaphragm which can cause it. Spicy foods, um, chocolate, coffee, alcohol, smoking can cause acid reflux. Um, and just generally being sedentary, uh, not getting up, moving around, uh, getting exercises we would like you to do to make you have acid reflux. Um, some of the symptoms are, in addition to that burning, you can actually have a cough, you can have a sore throat, uh, your teeth can actually kind of get eroded and, and lose their enamel, uh, things of that nature. And that's all due to that acid bubbling up, even during your sleep where you're laying down. Sometimes it'll wash up, you don't even know what's happening. You can get hoarseness, uh, <clears throat> a cough. Um, I've even seen people with pneumonia because of chronic uh, acid reflux. So definitely more than just that part. Uh, treatment is, you know, first off, we like to have you do some lifestyle changes. Uh, avoid those triggering foods. Get more exercise. If you need to lose some weight, lose some weight. Um, and there are some, some other maneuvers you can do to help. And then we like to move to medications. There are several medications on the market that can help. If none of that works, then there are also some surgical or procedural options to help deal with that problem. So just to kind of go over it a little bit, you know, first off, those lifestyle changes, lose weight, uh, quit smoking, avoid alcohol, coffee, caffeine, um, chocolates and things like that, spicy foods. Um, everybody likes their you know, chicken wings and pasta with tomato sauce and things of that nature, but we don't, we don't always agree with it. 
Um, so sometimes you can get a good bit of control just from you know, modifying what you eat and being mindful. Um, if you have problems with acid reflux when you're in bed asleep, uh, or when you lay down, you feel that wash come up your chest, maybe you taste it in your mouth. Another maneuver you can do is actually put some risers under the bed. Um, if you lift the head of your bed a few inches, put you on a little bit of a tilt and gravity to kind of help hold that down. If you're going to try that at home, it's important that you put it under the bed and you don't try just stacking pillows because if it bends you at the waist, it actually squeezes and can make it worse. So you want the whole bed to be at a little bit of an angle. And that can help a lot of people as well. Next is medications. Um, you know, there's three major categories of medications. First is tongues, you know, antacids, Rolaids, things like that. Those are great for controlling the symptoms when you're having them. So, you know, if you, you know, eat some tomato sauce, you feel that burn, you pop a Rolaids or a Tums, and it can kind of calm that down. Uh, so it treats the symptom, but it doesn't prevent the heartburn from happening. It just makes you feel a little bit better in that moment. The next up is the H2 blockers, which are things like Pepsi. Um, those can uh, be effective in a lot of people. Uh, it actually suppresses the acid. It makes it so that your stomach doesn't produce as much acid as it normally would. And so less acid means less acid that can come up. So that can be helpful. And then for some people, the H2 blockers are just not powerful enough. And so we also have the proton pump inhibitors, things like Prolitec, Nexium, Crevacin, um, which are the ones you see most of the commercials about, the purple pill. Um, and that kind of does a better job. It really knocks down that acid production. It gives people a lot of relief. So, you know, a lot of people will take medication and either they'll do it for a week or two at a time when they have flares or some people take it all the time um, and, and it can be very effective. I think most people with acid reflux are able to manage it with lifestyle changes and, and medications. Now when we talk about medications in the last few years there's been a lot of concern about risks of being on that medication long term. Um, the short term risks of, of proton pump inhibitors are basically close to none. You know, you take a two-week course, it's not going to cause you problems. Now, the real concern is long-term use. People like myself, who have been taking it for years and years and years and years. Um, there have been some reports of you know, some problems that crop up in people, things like low bone density, kidney problems, dementia, um, things of that nature, um, in people who've taken this over years and years and years and years. The science is weak. These are not strong, definite studies. It's more of an alarm bell. We say, hey, we see some signals in the community that maybe there's some sort of link between these problems and people who've been on these medications long term. Um, and so a lot more research needs to be done there to figure it out. And what I counsel people is that if you need to take it and you're not having any of those problems, you know, consider taking it. If you start having any of those issues, then maybe you should stop the medication. Um, just because we don't know for sure if it could be causing it. We don't want to cause something to be worse. So if your kidneys are fine, and you're thinking fine, and your bone density is fine, all that sort of stuff, and you're taking the medicine and you're doing well with it, I would continue on. But if you start to develop any of those sorts of problems, maybe that's a conversation to have with your doctor, or should you potentially come off those medicines. So that's kind of my review of, of what some of those kind of warning signs you might see on the internet or on TV or about. Um, I don't think it's a huge concern, but it's, it's worth paying attention to. So next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about surgery, and that's the part, the, the role that I play. Um, and I'm kind of gonna go from the least invasive things to the most invasive things that you can do for acid reflux. So first up is something called the Lynx device. It's fairly new, and when I say new in, in the world of medicine, I mean 15 years, you know, 20 years. Um, it hasn't been around forever, but it's been around for a little while. Um, sorry about that, I don't know how I went to the beginning. There we go. So the Lynx device is a pretty interesting device. I don't have a laser here, but on the left, you can see a picture of the stomach um, and what it's kind of passing through is the diaphragm. That's the muscle that helps you to breathe. And when you have acid reflux, that acid is going up past the diaphragm into the esophagus where it doesn't belong. 
So a Lynx device is basically, if you've seen the bracelets that kids wear, uh, it's the same sort of concept. You have a series of little magnetic beads on a string that's kind of elastic. And it's implanted around the esophagus right at the bottom, and it provides a squeeze, which kind of clamps shut the esophagus so the acid can't come up. Then when you swallow, because it's magnetic beads, they're able to pop apart and let food go through when they pop back together behind it, like a trapdoor. Um, it works pretty well for a lot of people. Um, and as far as operations are concerned, it, it is an operation to put it in, but it's, it's not a lot of work being done to you. You don't have a bunch of sewing and a bunch of dissection and things inside of you. It's just, you put that band around there and you're done. Um, the downside of this procedure is unfortunately it's still considered experimental and insurance in most places doesn't cover it. Um, so there are some places where you can go and have this done kind of as a cash pay sort of thing. Um, some places will kind of throw it in if you have another procedure. That's, that's something I've heard of. But for the most part, most insurances aren't covering this right now. But it's something to keep you know, in the back of your mind if you're thinking about this down the road. It is an option. And I would say in the next five or ten years, I would be surprised if it wasn't being covered. So it's a good procedure. Um, but when we start talking about things that are covered and that are a little bit more established, uh, we can talk about what's called a fundification. This is the gold standard of surgical treatment of acid reflux. And basically, you might have heard of a stomach wrap. That's what we're talking about. And in that procedure, as you can see on the bottom right, the floppy part of the stomach is wrapped around the esophagus and sealed up. And that provides a reinforcement, just like that rubber band did in the last slide. That provides a reinforcement to that esophagus that holds the acid down where it belongs. Now, because it's stomach muscle and it's not metal magnets, you know, it stretches and food can go down if it needs to. But um, it does a good job of holding the acid down. That's the gold standard. It's a procedure that's been done for over 50 years um, with good results. It used to be done as a you know open operation, a big cut up and down. That's back in the days. We do this laparoscopically now, so you typically will have five cuts, about a quarter to a half inch, to do that procedure. It's very minimally invasive. You go on the next day, and most people who are on antacids or PPIs, I take them off immediately and they don't have any more reflux. Some people will have a little bit of breakthrough reflux for a few days, but it's very rapid acting and it's very effective. So that's simple reflux. And then when you get a little bit more complicated, some people have a hernia, and that's what's causing their reflux. A hiatus hernia, or what's called a parasophageal hernia, kind of the same thing. And so what happens there is when the stomach is actually protruding up through a defect in the diaphragm. That can cause acid reflux as well, and it takes a little bit more work to fix because you don't just do the stomach graft, you have to fix the hernia. So there in the bottom, you can see kind of a little picture of the steps of that. We pull the stomach down where it's supposed to be, and then that area that's too wide, we stitch up to seal it up. Sometimes in people with very bad hernias, we put a piece of mesh to reinforce it, but I would say 90% of the time it's not needed, so we don't use it. Uh, at least I don't. Other people may do things differently. So it's a rare case to need mesh. Typically, we do it just with stitches. Once that stomach is back where it's supposed to be and the diaphragm is closed up, we typically will do a stomach wrap in addition to that to make sure that you don't have acid reflux in the end. So a little bit more complicated procedure, but it's still done laparoscopically. You still have just the five little cuts about that big. Um, and again, you, know, you go home the next day and most people feel a lot better. So pretty good operation. So, you know, if you're having problems with this, you know, we're happy to take care of you right here in town. Um, you don't need uh, robots and lasers to take care of this problem. Uh, we can get it done for you. Uh, we're happy to see you. Whether you need surgery or not, if you just need medication, you know, we can go through all those options you know, and try to help you out. Uh, just to go over our surgical practice in general, uh, we're Silicon Surgical Associates. We do the full breadth of general surgery, including cancer surgery, laparoscopic surgery, colon and intestinal surgery, hernias, acid reflux, weight loss, breast surgery, whether it's for cancer or if it's for. Um, just a, a cyst or a, a lesion. Um, we also do endoscopy, so if you need a scope done, 
upper or colonoscopies. We can take care of that for you too. Our practice consists of Dr. Campos, myself, and Dr. Overcash, and Ms. Small, Smallwood, who uh, does a lot of work and helps us out a lot. Um, I'll take any questions now. Um, if anybody wants to ask anything, otherwise I'll let you get back to lunch. Thank you. Do y'all have any questions? Dr. Dominic, can we go back to, okay. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've been taking that promise that, like for 25 years, mm -hmm. what is the danger? Now, I've just recently been treated for low bone density. Mm -hmm. Do I need to come off of that? So, I'm not going to tell you specifically if you need to come off of it or not, because we're not in the office, but I think it's worth a conversation with your doctor. Um, if it's something that you know they're concerned about, they can give you some advice on that. And when I am out of my set, the best thing I can find, which roll aids naturally, but mm. is baking soda and water. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to do that? That is okay to do. Um, baking soda and water is a little bit like crumbling up the Tums and, and drinking it as a slurry. Um, you know, Tums has a few other things in it as well, but it's the same concept. It neutralizes that acid, and so it can definitely give you some relief in the moment. Oh, yeah. um, but your body's still making the acid. It doesn't turn off those acid pumps. Immediately, that baking soda and water, I mean, just yeah. right then, it gets rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's like pouring water on the fire. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like a good home remedy to me. Oh, <laughs> and we've all got a few of those in our pocket. Some, some of them home remedies are pretty good. That's right. They, they are. They are. Dr. Dylan, go back to the slide about the side effects. Mm -hmm. And let's look at that again, because I that was one of my questions. So when you talk about medication risk, and we all... How many of us see uh, a commercial and you're thinking, oh, I'm taking that, and then by the time they go through all the risks, you're like, oh, I'm better off the way I am, and all the fear and stuff that's attacked uh, to that sometimes can be overwhelming, right? You don't know whether to take it or not take it. So can you walk us through that and which medications you're specifically talking about on that list? Absolutely. Again? So this risk, uh, or this slide, is, is only referring to the proton pump inhibitors. So the Nexiums, the Prolisex, the uh, Protonix, those, those class of medications. The Tums, the Rolades, this has nothing to do with those. The Pepsid, this has nothing to do with those. This is purely for those proton pump inhibitors. And um, as I mentioned, if you take any, or as Dr. Or as Ms. Green mentioned, if you take any medication, you open up that box, you read the pamphlet, there's going to be about 400 side effects and risks in that pamphlet. And the reason for that is that any time as the medicine is going through approval process, any time a patient who's taking the medicine has basically anything go wrong with them, they have to report that. And then that goes in the, in the list. It doesn't necessarily mean it was caused by the medication, it just means they can't prove it wasn't. And so this is the same thing with this slide. Uh, you know, when I talk about signal, what I'm talking about is when a study shows maybe a little bit of a push towards something, but it's not statistically showing it. It's just showing what we'll cause signal. So it looks like maybe, possibly, kind of, a little bit, the people who are taking this medicine might have a little bit higher propensity for some of these problems. Um, and the, the issue is that everybody in the world takes these medicines, and these are super common problems. And so how do you link that? And that takes very, very big, expensive studies to figure out, because you've got to put thousands and thousands and thousands of people in a study arm, and thousands of people in a control arm, and you have to compare them over 20 years. And those studies are just they're very difficult to perform and get good data from. So you're probably never going to see conclusive evidence of this um, because it's such a small signal. But it's enough that somebody said, hey, I wonder if something's here. And so I try to tell you all about anything you're going to hear on TV. Uh, if Morgan and Morgan might put a commercial out on about, <laughs> about it, I want to talk to you about it because I know I'm going to get questions in the office about it. Um, and that's kind of my spiel on it. There's signal. It's weak, 
And I think all I can tell you is I've been taking that medicine for 20 years. And I'll let other people comment on whether I had dementia or not. I don't know. But, <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't take it if I didn't think it was safe. But everybody's different. And so it's worth the conversation with your doctor if you're having any issues that you were concerned might be related to that medicine. I just think since COVID, this is just a you know a question or comment. I think since COVID, people put a lot more thought or emphasis on what I've taken, what's in my body, what does it affect, what does it cause. So I think we just pay closer attention to things like that. So that's a great slide for us just to consider and look at our uh, medication and look what we're on. Actually, I'll go ahead and. I tell you, R.D. Morris, our pharmacist, is going to do next month, and so he'll be talking about some of this. And again, once our medicine list begins to grow, once we are to the point we have that little pill organizer, you know, I know what I'm talking about. Once we get to that point, then it is time to start and see how all that interacts and how does that work and what works together and what doesn't work together and what might be causing dementia or kidney disease and so I think that's going to be a really good program next month if we as we dig a little bit deeper into medication and how all that interacts. Any more question about heartburn or we heard him say what not to eat. Where does that so Zantac was an H2 blocker, so it falls in the same class as Pepsid, but as far as I know, that's off the market. I haven't looked for it recently, but I think it's been off the market for a couple of years now. Yes, sir. Yes, it's a little bit off the deep path, but you were talking about the television advertisements for all these medications. Uh, and it's always been strange to me. You cannot, it's being broadcast to the general public. You can't get this over the counter. You have to, you know, have a prescription. And how many of your patients, as the commentator says, ask your doctor about? Uh, <laughs> does that happen all the time? Or are we wasting money trying to hit the population when only a doctor can give it to you? Well, that's kind of an advertising uh, and marketing question. Um, so who's wasting the money? You know, Merck, I guess, is wasting the money. It's coming out of their ad budget. Um, so obviously they wouldn't spend that money if it wasn't working. But I think the idea there is that these new medications, they can, they can tell the doctors about it. They can come. They can show us all the great things about it. But they're usually brand new medicines that are expensive, and so they want to drive Ooh. demand for that medication. So they're trying to make sure that patients know about it and go in and ask about it so that there's more market pressure towards that medication. Um, but it's, that's purely, purely advertising stuff. Um, most of the time, the specialist you're seeing who's appropriate for that medicine already knows about it, but there's probably some generic medicine that's a heck of a lot cheaper that they usually prescribe. Any other questions? I have one more. Maybe I'm part of the audience today. So tell us again when it is our acid reflux, heartburn, GERDs, whatever is bad enough that it's time to come see a surgeon, come see you. That's a real, real good question. When, when is that? <laughs> so, you know, I, I do see people who come for reflux and I tell them I don't think you need surgery. You know, and that, so first of all, if you come see me, I don't think you need surgery, I'll tell you that. Uh, we're not gonna try to, try to pull you in if you don't need it. But I would say that a lot of this is lifestyle based. So what are your symptoms? How much torture and pain are you experiencing from this heartburn? If you have a little flare of heartburn after you eat spaghetti once a month, you don't need an operation. You know, just, you know, don't eat spaghetti or eat it and pay for it. <laughs> or take some tones with That's what I talked about right. earlier, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's not the person that, that needs an operation. The person that I'm more interested in talking to about an operation is the person who has daily symptoms, is miserable, and has either tried medication and that failed, or for whatever reason, they don't want to take medication long term for it, whether it's for this reason or they just don't want to take a pill. Maybe that's the only, take, the, the only pill they take and they don't want to deal with it. Um, so from a lifestyle standpoint, that's the person I really think could benefit the most from surgery is, is trying to get off of that medicine. The other side of it is some patients who have 
precancerous problems of the esophagus. So they have you know, either Barrett's esophagus, which is that precancerous condition, they're having these strictures and all this scar tissue build up in their esophagus because of the acid reflux. Those might be patients who would also benefit from having an operation just to kind of get rid of that, get rid of that chronic problem and help the esophagus heal. And again, usually that's people who the medicine is just not working for. Um, so those, those are the two categories, lifestyle and then kind of long-term kind of permanent damage being caused. Those are the two patient populations I'm more interested in talking to about as we Yes, sir. Would you, uh, before doing any kind of surgery, would you do a uh, endoscopy to get, try to make a definitive uh, decision on whether it would really, really be helpful? I typically do, um, both for that reason and because you want to rule out other problems. So I want to see do you have ulcers. I want to see do you have, God forbid, a cancer in there that needs to be treated first. Um, I want to make sure that you don't have a hernia that I need to fix. So that helps me decide what operation to do. Um, we want to check for infections in the stomach. So that's definitely part of the you know, pre-operative workup. If we're not sure if your symptoms are coming from acid reflux at all, there's a test that can be done called a Bravo test where they actually clip a little sensor inside your esophagus and they measure the acid over time to make sure that that's truly what's happening. And then there's also a study that we sometimes do called a manometry where we check the esophagus squeeze to make sure the esophagus is working right. So there are several steps that we may do before an operation to kind of check all that out, depending on what's going on. Any other questions? Okay, go back to the slide about all the surgeries we do. I don't want this to be lost on us. So while we're here today, guys, we have grown a fantastic surgical department. Um, Dr. Diamond, obviously you're here today. You probably know him, he's been here nine years. We've got Dr. Juan Campos and Dr. Overcash, Dr. and then we have Tinsley Smallwood as a nurse practitioner, so it has grown. There's no reason to go anywhere for these surgeries. We have a phenomenal group of surgeons, and we can take really great care of you right here in your hometown, make it personal, uh, but add the quality to it. So please just make sure you look at that list, pick up the phone, call us, make an appointment. Uh, we want to take care of you. Uh, you know, we want to take care of our people and even more. So be sure not to leave today without thinking, well, it's not acid reflux, but there's something else I need to check on. My gallbladder, you know. <laughs> uh, I've got this hernia that really needs some attention. Those kind of things. So good general surgery right here at Coosa Valley in Silicaga, ready to take care of you. So don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call us about any of these, even if you're just not sure. We want to see you, we want to take care of you.